Hi everyone, thanks so much for tuning in again. Today we have Sean Atwood and his partner in crime, literally, Wild Man. So basically I went on Sean and Wildman's post, can I say, uh, it's both you, is it both your podcasts? True Crime that? Podcast. Yeah. 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 Um, which will be all below this if you want to check it out. Do check it out because, well, as you're going to find out, there's some amazing stories and they have some amazing people on, including myself. Um, yeah, so... Tell us, like, where everything started, like, from a young... Obviously, it's from a very young age, and tell us all about yourselves. It started in Widnes, where we were born, this little chemical manufacturing town, didn't it? Yeah, it did, yeah. And he went to a different school from me. I was a bit more studious, and Peter um, was a bit wild. <laughs> I, got, I got expelled at, like, 13. What for? Putting a teacher in the bin. Pardon? <laughs> but it, I put a teacher in the bin. What it was, he kept on like sort of picking on me, and as I was coming out of where you get your food, yeah, I was coming out of there, and he stood right near the bins, and he's having a cigarette, and he called me over, and he said, "You haven't got your tie done properly and all that." And I thought to myself, "I'm going to have you." So I just like they have them like big industrial bins where they put all the slots, <laughs> <laughs> so I just threw him in. <laughs> They got splendid indefinitely for that. Ooh. And then they had a private tutor from 9 o'clock to 11. I just did English and math. Mm-hmm. And then I could go home. And then um, I ended up going to all the other schools around me and getting into fights and stuff. So I actually got expelled. So um, I left school in would have been the fourth year. Right. So what age was that? That's like 14, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Okay. And his o- his you, oldest Sean? brother was the head of our little street gang called the Sweats. We'd watched the Sweats. Lo- <laughs> we'd watched. <laughs> that sounds nice. <laughs> we'd watched a lot of um, American street gang movies, like The Warriors and The Wanderers. So we were the Sweats, and he wouldn't let Peter join the gang, and he picked on him. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so I eventually splintered off from them and hung out with Peter. Right. And then we formed our own alliance. Just you two? Yes. So this is like from a really, really young age and now you're Oh, yeah, you're we still, were tight from kids, still, yeah. Oh, I love that. So let's get to it. Where did the... So you it was stocks and shares, weren't it? Was it? Well, I started following the stock market when I was 14. And yeah. my teacher was like explaining the Financial Times, all that stuff. 16, I asked my mum and dad for some money to invest... Because Maggie Thatcher was privatising these yeah. companies and they told me to bugger off because they were Labour supporters. And they were like, we're not Tories like, you, like your nan. Who do you think we're asking us for money for Margaret bloody Thatcher? So I thought, all right, my nan. Hit my nan up. She gave me 50 quid. Doubled it right away in BT shares. And that was it. I was hooked. At the top of our town, there's a quarry called Peck on Peck's Hill. And there's a tree overlooking this quarry. So me and Peter and his cousin Hammy, we'd go up this tree and we called it the thinking tree. And we'd sit there and uh, I was like, yeah, you know, I'm going to go to America, make a million in the stock market, fly you guys over. And that's what happened. Amazing. And all this stemmed from a thinking tree. Yeah. <laughs> the thinking tree. <laughs> Peck Hill come famous many years ago. Could, um, remember Brookside? Yeah. It's where Barry Grant did all these like gangsterish <coughs> things up there. Oh, really? Yeah. It's like the really posh houses up there. So a lot's gone on there then. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big quarry. And at oh. one time it was just full of water. Right. There was always like robbed cars and people getting through in there and stuff. You were throwing people in there? Not me, personally. <laughs> no. I plead the fifth. <laughs> 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 so, you're what age now when you're talking about this? You're, what, you're still in your teens, are you? Yeah, I'm, um, I'd be 20 now. 20? Yeah. Because I went to prison when I was 21. Right. What was that for? Street robbery. Right. And I, I did two and a half. And I got out. And Sean said, look, do you want to come over? Because you just got to... Oh, that was it. I'd been out six months and um, I got caught up in the GBH and broke the guy's jaw, put him in hospital for a while. So 
I was up for Crown Court, and Sean said, do you want to come over? Because you've just got to get sent down again. So I did a flight. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll come over to stay out of trouble. Famous last words. When you're saying flying, so is this when you're in Arizona, is it? So I went to Arizona in 1991. Right. I'm working as a stockbroker, glorified telesales. Your family lived there as well, didn't you? You had aunties in Arizona, yeah, is that right? Yeah, aunts and uncles, that's how I went out there. Like my aunt, when I was a kid, when I was 16 actually, she changed my date of birth in my passport so I could go nightclub in Arizona. <gasps> so I was 21. What a sick auntie. And then really? she, my aunties are so shit. <laughs> and then she in- introduced me to all these beautiful American women as Paul McCartney's nephew. No! Yeah! Oh my God, go on. So can you imagine the effect that had on me, coming from Witness, Arizona, plane landing, swimming pools in all the backyards, sun's out, they hear the English accent, they roll out the red carpet. They're a bit you- thick, the Yanks, they think, do you know the royal family? Do you know such a person? I met him once called Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Have you had tea and crumpets with the Spice Girls? <laughs> In prison, later on, guards and prisoners, some, asked me, what language do they speak in England? What? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, I was dazzled by Arizona, coming from Witness, like this sunny place where they hear the English accent, and you're in. And um, in your element, wouldn't I'm you? I'm thinking, right, when I finish uni, I want to come out here and get some of this. That's what were you what doing at uni? The business studies at Liverpool Uni. Right, okay. And that was our primary raving days in Liverpool yeah. and Manchester was like late 80s to 91. Right, tell us about the raving days. That's what we want to hear about as well. In the beginning, me and Peter were just driving around Liverpool. And what was that one we went to? We, we, at first, we went up there and we were shirt and tied up. We did go, used to go raving at first. We Mr. Smith's in Warrington. We used to go Mr. Smith's in Warrington. <laughs> And then in Liverpool, <laughs> Coconut Grove in Toxteth. And then we used to go to um, grab a granny, didn't we? The gra- what was it called, that one? Grafton. The Grafton. <laughs> so we started off going places like that. And then we were going home, and we went past the warehouse in Beaumont Street. And we heard this music. So we went to see what it was, and it was basically these two big black guys, and they had that Tesco carrier bag on an Asda bag. And you put a tenner in it, and you'd go in. And it was an old scrapyard, but they were doing like a, a rave, an illegal rave. So we were there, and we didn't have no, no drugs or anything. We thought, we like this, we're going to come back here again. And it got cut short because the police come and set the dogs on us. But everyone got off. But the next week, we went, we drip, got some new claws. We looked a bit shady, really, in suits. You know what I mean? We looked like coppers. <laughs> no, why did you go? Why were you at a ravings? Oh, no, you didn't plan to go. Yeah, to I was just starting. Gym. Right. And everyone before the scene, you had to line up with your shoe, shirt, shirt and tie on or whatever suit. And the bouncers would come out and maybe they'd let you in. Maybe they wouldn't. And the young people got sick of it and just started breaking into warehouses and wearing what the hell they wanted. That's how it started. I'm just trying to picture you two in like in a suit in a rave. <laughs> <laughs> but the first clubs we went were Thunderdome and Conspiracy in Manchester, weren't they? Conspiracy, yeah. Oh, I've never even heard of them. And Sound Showing Gardens. your age now, boys. I don't. Thunderdome was on Oldham Road. Right. Dodgy as hell, wasn't it? Was a sol- big Salford crew in so there. So what music was that now? Was that like like heavy like techno and stuff like no, that? No, it was Acid House. Like and acid it was like oh yeah, it had, had the lyrics. House, yeah. So, can you nice remember? Nice woman's voice, like sunshine on a rainy day. Yeah. That type of music. Right. I'll house you, all that stuff. So, when did you get into? Obviously, we'll get to the other bits in a bit, but like, so, were you, ta- were you obviously taking pills and stuff when you started going to raves and things like that? Yeah, we first took, I mean, we were like that, shall we, or shan't we? And we met the local dealer, they were just outside. And at the time, they were like £25. They were like, Big brown disco biscuits. And uh, <laughs> we had one and we thought, oh, it's really in that. <laughs> you know, just like that, you start bobbing. And you, oh, you know, you <laughs> you went, oh, yeah, it's cool, isn't it? So you've started obviously dabbling in like taking stuff and whatever. When did you kind of then get into the whole industry of 
Well, that like took a long time because I was working as a stock broker for, for like five to seven years. Right. Peter was in England for that period of time. I was selling weed and speed. Weed and speed? And I'm thinking, right, if we get into Arizona, he can come out here and be a wrestler. Right. <laughs> I was a bit idealistic. So I got him a flat right next to the Georgian Dragon British pub in Central Phoenix. Right. Thinking he'll just go in and have a bevy with the fellas from England, the expats. Yeah. Get him a job as a wrestler and we'll live happily ever after. Right. And what happened then? Me and my bird show up at the flat a couple of weeks or months into it. And we knock on the door and a bunch of Mexicans answer the door. And I say, where's Peter? And they're like, what? I said, where's Peter? He lives here. They go, pizza? There's no one. We don't have pizza. No, Peter, he lives here. And then they all just pull guns <laughs> out. And the Colombian guy who's the boss, who's a crack dealer, comes out. He's got his gun out. They're like, you know, who, who are you looking for? Oh and we're God. backpedaling across the street thinking we're about to get a shot. Peter walks over the road, smiling, goes, um, oh, don't worry about them, la." That's the local Colombian crack lord, and they're these Mexican salesmen. And I've rented my apartment out to them because they like to move around a lot and they're buzzing because I can smoke a hundred dollar crack rock in one breath. What the hell? So go on, you've ended up with what were they like? The lo- local like crack like yeah, so they're, they're the local dealers around there, and you see cars pull up and they pick up and all that. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> and I got talking to him. He really liked my action. And we were saying we're looking for somewhere to stay. And I said, well, yeah, I'll show you the place. So I showed him where I was at. And he said, yo, we'll take it, we'll take it, whatever you want. So I went over the road to like a guy that I'd met. I said, listen, I'll have to stay with you for a couple of weeks. I said, I'll sort you out with some crack and some crystal." Say, oh yeah, but yeah, you're welcome, English, you're welcome. Well, he used to call me also at the time, it means Burr. So, go over there, and I went over, arranged the price with him. It was basically as much crack as I wanted, and $100 a week. So, I thought, I'll rent it, I'll, I'll sub it to these. I forgot to tell you. <laughs> Like you do. <laughs> yeah, I just nearly get shot. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think you'd mind. Like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I thought you'd think, oh, it's enterprising, really. So what what happened from there? Did you obviously just, so you found this out and it's just become the norm that this is happening? That was just the beginning. Yeah. So this, would you say this <laughs> that is was where mild. it's... Is this where it started? <laughs> like, this started to unfold everything else? Because you're still working as a stockbroker at yeah. this point, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. what the fuck's going on? Uh, in the end, the, 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 uh, the crack dealers had to move on. They only stay there for about five, six weeks. And they've got to move on because the police have come otherwise. Right. So um, I, mo- I, mo- I moved back in my place. And it was brilliant because a lot of them were paranoid. So... I put my hand down the sofa like that, and they had big rocks of crack with them. They'd stash the drugs because they were that high, mm. but they forgot to stash them. <laughs> so I'm like, hey, <laughs> winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> enjoying it. And then, um, cut a long story short, I had a party, and some guy come over, shot himself in the head, and he's laying half in, in the flat and half out the flat. Please come, take me down, the homicide squad come, take my passport from me, do an investigation, come back as suicide, and uh, give me my passport back. But after that, I didn't want to live in that flat, I wanted to move yeah. somewhere else. So basically the apartment I rented him, he started out rent- renting it off with a, to a Colombian drug lord, mm-hmm. and it ended with a corpse on the doorstep. Shit. Mm. We had better days than that, like. <laughs> God, yeah, let's talk about those days. What, um, so that happened, obviously. And you, so you, you've what, got him another apartment? Yeah, he moved to the west side of Phoenix with this perm herd cowboy gangster are still, disciple guy. Are you guy. still like dead clean cut here? You I'm still doing a stockbroker. Still just. So we relocate him to this apartment on the west side. I think they're behind in their rent or something. 
So I put down some money for it. The steroid head bouncer, perm herd cowboy, says he's a tough. He's a tough guy. He's in there with these two women, and um, he, you know he, he's like talking all this tough stuff. This guy, and I'm thinking, you know, Dick. Peter's. Um, He's probably going to get purified by the wild man if he keeps talking like that. And he told me, he told me to do the dishes and tidy you up after myself. So <laughs> put his head through the wall. Literally got his head and just smashed it through the wall. And he, he went running out. We have no way of plaster the palace all over his head. <laughs> so I just put down like a thousand pound deposit to house Peter in this place. Right. So I call up the uh, apartment manager. And the apartment manager says, we're going to have to evict Peter. And I said, why? She said, because he's put his roommate's head through the wall. And I said, <laughs> did you see, I said, did you see him putting his roommate's head through the wall? And she said, no. But he was seen running through the apartment complex with plaster all over his head and face, <laughs> screaming. <laughs> People, someone to help him because he's been <laughs> assaulted. <laughs> didn't, tie, didn't somebody to tidy up again, though? <laughs> Fortunately, Peter had done this so quickly within moving in, they hadn't cashed the check. Oh, and I was able so to stop it. it. I was able to stop it. Yeah. Right. So you've got your grand back. The two girls that he was living with, one of them is dating a guy in Tempe, Arizona, who's right. behind on his rent. So Wildman moves there next, and this becomes the hub then for the beginning of the criminal enterprise. This is where we meet all our people, like Russian Mafia, Mexican Mafia, everyone through this. this Fascinating. Yeah. Come on, a, what happened? A, where we actually moved to, it was brilliant. It was like, um, it was a college apartment, so it was just like full of college people. Like the University of um, Arizona, Arizona State University. Right. Yeah. It was like, Two doors were for me. There was like cheerleaders, it was just, and they were all getting high. And it was just, I mean, it just made sense to sell drugs there. <laughs> Go on, tell us about the like the people that you've met and when it all started. When did it kind of start to? So this apartment um, is owned by a guy called Crybaby Joe, and um, he gets in debt with me. Crybaby Joe gets in debt with me. He's, he's trying to sell pills and stuff. And um, so Wildman just takes over the place then, starts to sell off all of his furniture. And there's holes in all the walls and the ceiling. And he just starts throwing his own parties and inviting everybody over from, like, street people, Native American transsexuals, Russian mafia, Mexican mafia. And it just became this non-stop party place. And everyone just got on. Everyone got on. It was amazing. They're all on ecstasy and all just hugging <laughs> and telling each other the life stories and we were just listening to chilled out music. Why the hell's like this kind of people all together like in one place? Wherever how Peter, that, wherever Peter went, wherever... I met these people, I don't know why or how or why, but I'd always bump into them and you track get them. talking to them, yeah. It's like this. When I was a young person in my teens, mm. I was a bit shy and anxious, so I got on the ecstasy. But Peter would talk to absolutely anybody. And that carried through into later in our lives. He opened all the doors for me to yeah. meet p certain people. So you kind of like bounced off each other in one way or another. Yeah, and wherever we, wherever he would go, whether it was LA, we all drove out to a rave in LA, took my whole crew out there. Peter's like, I'm not going. And by the end of the night, when we come home from that rave, he's got all the street people coming to the hotel room, giving him free drugs. There's so a guy in a viper's got a kilo of coke in it. He's, he's asking Peter to be his bodyguard. Wow. Wherever he goes. He just attracts it. He just attracts everyone. From, doesn't yeah. matter what walks of life they're from. Oh, that's good. He starts, he, he starts running the place. They said if we sent him down to Mexico and he behaved like he does, violent, they would kill him. Yeah. And he went down to Mexico and they called him El Oso de Burr because of his fighting style. The guys, the, the mafia guys there were running him round in jeans. Literally got nine lives. Buzzing off him. <laughs> Anywhere he goes, he just does it. He's got so, this ability. So you've got all these people in your life now. You, you said before, like, your people. When you say your people, were these people that, start, that started working for you? Or, like, where did all the, 
Misfits. We yeah. were a bunch of misfits who formed a crime family. Right. Not a traditional crime so family. This was ecstasy, wasn't it? It was the rave scene. There were people from all walks of life, odd people, and um, we became a really tight unit. What kind of people? So it, when you say, like, misfits, who was in the group? Obviously, I'm not saying names, but, like, what kind of people? Did you all... They range from Brainiac... Uh, Arizona State University students like the yeah. rabbit, like certain other people. To go on, you want to expand? There was uh, literally all sorts. There was like um, from university people to um, black gangsters, Antoine and stuff. Yeah, my um, top sales guy. When I first met him, he was homeless and, and smoking crack, and he, you know, I ended up get, helping him get a house and everything. Oh. He'd be moving to like ten thousand pills. He was. Yeah, he, he did his wrong though in the end, didn't he? In the end, there was a fallout between him, Skinner, and Peter, that caused some problems. Did that know. happen a lot when you were kind of working in that in- industry? Where well, it ended up about two hundred people working for me. Shit. So there was. Let's let's <sighs> start from um, before like we go too much into that. Yeah. So. You've said it, this is where... So this new place is your new hub. Like yes. Branch or Murder, yeah. yeah Rancho Rancho Rancho. Rancho. So how the hell did you end up, like, selling, like, the amount that you did on the scale? Was it, like, for, I read £4 million worth or something? All right, so at the Rancho Murrieta level, this is an experiment now for me. I'm still a stockbroker. Okay. So <laughs> what... As what, if uh, she's still doing that. Uh, we're having these parties that I've described, and we can get about 100 pills from the local dealers. And they're going like that. And I'm seeing the business potential of it now. Right. So I find out that they're getting them from LA. Me and Peter and Seth and Acid Joey, and Seth and Acid Joey are dead now. We all go out to LA and um, we're parked outside this surfer gangster's house waiting for him to come home to to get these pills. And he, he comes in, I go in on my own. Those guys are like my backup outside. And, um, I've got all this money on me, like, I don't know, 10, 15,000. I'm thinking, am I going to get robbed? You know, with the cops watching this place, what's going to happen? And he, he goes into a back room and he comes out with the biggest bag of ecstasy pills I've ever seen in my life. Like a thousand Mitsubishi or something like that. So I say, all right, can I try one? He goes, do you want me to get you a drink? I'm like, no, nah, I'm just going to chew it because I know what the taste of ecstasy is. So I just chewed it and it was a good pill. And that was it. We, we we all dropped pills, drove back, and got to his place, and they were they were gone in the weekend. They were all sold. So I'm thinking, do I want to keep working the stock market, working these? What did you hours? make from that? From selling them? Do you remember? Um. All right. So this was before it was like there was multiple levels of the sales dis- distribution uh, channels. I was just doing it on my own on this experimental basis. So I bought those for about, I don't know, about $12 a pill. And they were going anywhere from $20 to $30 a pill, depending on how much people bought. So I doubled whatever the money was in a weekend. And then so you were weighing up, why am I doing stockbroking? Yes. Like, shall I move out of it? Yes. And did you? Is that when you, was it an immediate I did, thing? yeah. But Peter, then... His stay was not that long because he ended up getting deported for the first time. To back, what, back to here? Yeah. Right. I ended up getting um, kicked out from America. And I was in immigration for about four months and I got deported four back. Four months? Yeah. What was that like? Um, it wasn't too bad, really. It was because... Oh, excuse me. For one, I was the biggest person in there because they're all little Mexicans. And they're only about as big. And the food was really good. It's not like prison. It's like, um, <laughs> it's sort of like you're, you're in a detention centre, but they right. don't treat you like a prison. You, you're allowed to You're just money. chilled. You're just dead chilled, yeah. Right, okay. Got deported, come back to England. I was home for about, oh, I met some bird, the gobby scouser, and a. Uh, <laughs> Is that funny? With the house, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you need. We need to remember to tell that story. And uh, let's just call a wild woman. Yeah, she um, she was going through a divorce, and her husband was being an ass to her. So I moved in, and basically kicked him out. You moved in while he was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Go on. And he packed all this stuff out, threw it outside, and then um, he, 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 he wouldn't want to fight. I, I grabbed him, pinned against the wall, but he didn't want to fight. So he, he just left saying it's not fur, this. I said, oh, well, life ain't fur, is it? So I booed him out of his own house, and then I just move in. That bear. I don't I didn't even own her a week. Jesus. We got on. I mean, the first year was brilliant. It was just like, I suppose we were still in love then. Yeah. But um, after that, it just went downhill rapidly. Did you find, obviously, because like, you were away and stuff, so obviously you've got this bird that you'd met after a week. So relationships and stuff, has it been like difficult because of you've not had no, you've had far from an ordinary life, haven't you? What have what have your relationships been like and stuff like that, like with women and stuff? You have you been married, Sean? Yeah, three times. Three times. Yeah. Have you really? Yeah. Are you married now? No. What about you? I'm married. Yeah. You're married. Been married first. Not to this one though that you were talking about. No, 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 not to the <laughs> mad scouser. No, as um, I've been married for about five years. Right. She's completely different to me. She's like, um, well, I, I've changed now. I don't, yeah. I don't do drugs no more. Do you think it's because you're older? No, I just think I've got a good woman behind me. Oh. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm settled. Yeah. You're um, content now. Yeah, I'm content. Yeah. So, come on, anyway, we need to, let's get back to the juicy stuff that everyone wants to hear about. So, all this is going on, you're... You st- so you, you if you quit the stock market, so now. I quit the stock market as a stock broker while Peter was there on his first visit. So now I've gone, f- I've chose to go full time into the party scene. Okay, Peter's back in England now for about two years or so. Did you miss him? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Because you have got like obviously an emotional attachment, haven't you? You're a team, like working together as yeah. a team. Yeah. So, but I just continue to build it up criminal enterprise with the connections peter had helped me establish right so peter was my main protection as well and well, he did introduce that. me to some tough people right okay including um we'll just say a mexican-american person because he's got a bit paranoid about us uh, about saying his same yeah. stories about him okay yeah it was who was connected to the mexican mafia the new mexican mafia who who became our uh, I, I got into business with them as well, yeah. You got into business with the Mexican Mafia? The new Mexican Mafia. Shit. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about that. Like, how, well, how do you get into... How, how do you just get into business with somebody like that? With what, people like at that? At Rancho Murrieta, there was a series of parties that we had, and the Mexican-American person would come over, and um, he was dealing coke and weed, and I was dealing the E. And at one of these parties... A policeman just walked into the room and the policeman who walked into the room said, I can smell weed from outside, nobody move, goes to grab his radio like he's going to call it and have us all arrested. So the Mexican-American guy just pulls out his gun, points at the cop, says, the only one who's not leaving is you, M.F. Everybody run. So we all run off into the night. And we're thinking we're going to get arrested. I go to a nearby apartment and... um, we're like, should we flush our drugs? What's going to happen? The cop's going to come. There's like a helicopter coming. There's police sirens and everything. And I was like, bam, 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 bam. Knock on the door. Let me in. It's, it's him. We pulled the gar- gun on the cops. So, so he says, don't open the door. Turn the lights off. Turn the TV off. If they've not got a warrant, they can't come in. If they knock on the door, don't answer it. And that's what happened. Thank and, God you had him. Yeah. And at the end of the night, he goes... Because you and your friends protected me, me and my brothers have got your back. Oh, amazing. So months later, I go over to the house. Right. There's all these lowriders on the street. And his brother answers the door and he's looking up at me and he's like, here's my English accent. And he goes, damn, you talk funny, homie. <laughs> it's like, you, you, I guess you are from England. Come in and meet my homeboys. <laughs> so I go in the living room and they're all in there, these massive tattooed Mexican-Americans. They've all got the chains on, little... Wife beat a vest, shorts down below the knees, all the prison tattoos, yeah. all kinds of weapons, slabs of coke, slabs of crystal meth, weighing machines. And I'm looking around the room, at the biggest TV I've ever seen in my life, next to a little TV with CCTV showing everything on the road, so they're looking yeah. out for the police are coming. Yeah. But I do a double take when I look at the TV. I'm like, hold on a minute, I've seen one of them before. 
It's got a rocket propelled grenade launcher on top of the TV. A what? Rocket propelled grenade launcher. What the fuck? It shoots. You can put a missile in it and shoot down a helicopter. Like no. a bazooka. Oh my god. And I still didn't know who they were, and I was in business with them for years. And it was only when I took the Mexican American guy back to his brother's house years later, the whole neighborhood was blacked out, and the police were out directing traffic with light ones, and they were all getting brought out in, in handcuffs by a federal SWAT team, and it showed all the pictures on the news, and that said who they were then. And that's how I knew who And they that's were how then. you found out. That's when I found out, yeah. I suppose it doesn't really matter though. If someone's like got you back, you're just not you're not even bothered, are you? You're not no, really the... he was a solid dude. Our guy who yeah. protected us in Arizona. Yeah, he was really he really really had that back. Obviously, I love and trust Peter the most out of everybody. But I would say after Peter, it, it, it would have been him. Yeah. I got on with him as soon as we met. We, we got on sound. It was just like we were just like double trouble. Really, we were so much like one another. I didn't like his brothers too much. But he did He did tell me from the get-go, don't ever take wild man to my brother's house. They won't get along. They won't get along? Yeah. So you didn't do that then? No. Well, he did. <laughs> well. Guys, <laughs> he turned up once. We'll he, did turn, he did turn up once. <laughs> and they were at the door with like AK-47s and mini machine guns. And I, I they let me in. They go, he's not coming in. And he doesn't just walk away. He's like, I'm not fucking, I'm not effing coming in. Who are you telling me I'm not? Oh, my And I'm, like, God. dragging him away, and he's, like, yelling at him. Did you not shit yourself, like, when he was oh kind of like that? Like, Yeah, I did. I half shit myself, but I half was my decision-making process was scrambled by drugs as well. It gives you false bravery. Yeah. So, skipping forward now, you, you both... Are you both in jail together? Like, so all this has been going on, you've... How did you get caught? What the hell happened? And, and tell us about prison there, life. There was abroad. witness statements. There was the fallout with Wildman and Skinner. Skinner became the main police informant. There was 10 informants. So there was someone ratting on you in your ratting group? On us. Skinner, yeah, the main guy who was my main salesman. Who I, the guy who got the house who was living in the dumpsters before. He fell out with Wildman. He became an informant. May 16th, 2002 was the first SWAT team arrests. And, um, Why was he doing that? Was he getting paid? Is that what happens? He was Why scared he for his it? life, apparently, because um, I was going to kill him. So that's why he started grassing? Yeah. He had some black gangsters he's hanging out with, and he formed, uh, there was like a conspiracy, whereby while woman's apartment, while Peter was in uh, federal imita- uh, immigration deportation prison, while woman's apartment was firebombed. <sighs> right. And then these the black gangsters showed up to take Wild Woman to safety. And she's like, I ain't getting a car with you with all my pills. <laughs> and we later found out that Skinner had orchestrated the whole thing. Shit. Firebomb comes right through the window, almost sets her on fire. So Peter's in deportation. And Skinner's thinking he's never going to get in, back in the country. So I hire a lawyer to expedite the process, get him out and fly him right back, smuggle him right back in again. So he's come back in. He's back in and now Skinner's terrified. Did that like three times, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So you've been snit. So he's, so sni- mate, he's like conspiring behind your back. and. So I, I, I know it's all got too heavy and I've quit the importation. Right. And just, I'm just chilling out in an apartment in Scottsdale with my bird. And May 16th, 2002, I'm on the computer. I'm back to doing stock trading. And it's like, bam, 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 on the door. It's a SWAT team. And they came for Peter as well. So all simultaneous arrests. Yeah, they arrested all of us in, in the same day. What was, what was your day of arrest like? Oh, it was horrible because, well, I just took a massive big hit of crack. And like, I'm like, whoa. And then... And they just bang, bang, bang on the door. And I look, and it's the police. And I just opened the door. I went, oh, it's the police. And shut the door again. I thought, oh, shit, it is as well. So they said, they had the, like, guns out and all that. And my house had a gate. They knocked the gate into the front, right, into the hallway. They come in, and then get on the ground, get on the ground, shouting, bawling. They put the gun to you. Hands behind your back, the cuffers, and put us in a van. And didn't know, didn't tell me what for. Didn't say anything. Just 
So it basically just took, yeah. just took me. Uh, is this what happened? Is, is this similar to what happened to you as well? Yeah, we go to Tempe Police. We've got this mobile unit where we all get booked into there. We go to Tempe Police Station. But then we enter the t- at the night time. They transfer us all over to Sheriff Joe Arpaio's Madison Street Jail, the Maricopa County Jail, which has got the highest rate of death and and mayhem in the whole country. And this Shit. place is like off the hook. Guards murdering mentally ill prisoners, gang members murdering prisoners. I've got videos of both mur- murders on, on my YouTube channel. But fortunately, I, I got arrested with Peter. He's, a, you know, look, I mean, look at the size of me. <laughs> Peter's a good guy to get arrested with. Jesus Christ! Yeah. So you knew where you were heading for. Did you act? Did you know about the reputation of the jail then? Well, Peter had been in a, the horseshoe before, and he told us what it was like. Yeah, I'd been arrested a couple of times, and only did the odd week or two of the. I think the most I did was twelve weeks, so I knew what we were heading for. I didn't know how much time we were heading for. Yeah. But I knew where we were going. And I was, I mean, everything's an adventure to me. I, I didn't, I don't worry about anything. You just like riding through because you know, it's out of your control anyway, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so I mean, there's no point in stressing about it. There's no yeah. point worrying about it. There's nothing you can do. So just go with just the flow. Go with it. Make the best of a bad situation. Yeah. Literally, like, a really bad situation. But <laughs> yeah. So... What was so? What happened? Did you get? Were you sentenced quickly? Well, our first year we we're together, and I'm fighting it for um, 26 months. But they box me off in the higher security levels because they say that we are influencing the co-defendants. Right. We're telling them not to sign plea bargains. So then they like they want to get Peter goes off to prison. They get me away from everybody. They separate you two. Yeah, yeah. 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 They, they can basically put a thing on you, do not house together, so they keep you yeah. all separate. So I'm like in, I'm, I'm locked down for a lot of it. But Peter, as soon as he got to the, the prison after a year in the jail, the Aryan Brotherhood guys come up to him and ask him what his charge is for, and he had a bad day. So there was a situation arose. Oh, no. And, but, and, basically, and these guys decide to live and die in the prison system. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone cows down to them, usually. Except for him. <laughs> What's with all the bad stories about me? <laughs> I'm, the in, I'm the innocent one, though. <laughs> look at, look uh, at my face. He's evil. Boy next door. <laughs> I went over there to stay out of trouble. I went, I went from... I would have only done two years if I stayed in England. From I thought I'd run away and end up doing seven and a half. Is that how long you did? Day for day, seven and a half. Tried to get him a job as a wrestler. And Look now what, what happened. Oh, what happened? I got, I got... Talk um, about a detour. I got sentenced to nine and a half years. I got the lawyer that the New Mexican Mafia recommended I got his name. Well, I keep his name out of it, actually. But he got me um, a loophole whereby as a first-time non-violent drug offender, I would only have to do six. Right. So... So by that was, by that, reducing that was being f- let off easy, was it, doing the nine and a half? I feel that um, if I hadn't got that lawyer, I'd still be in prison because I was, I was we, right away they put serious drug offender status on us, which carries 25 to life. And then, and then in my second year, when I wasn't signing the plea bargain, they said, right, you've got to, they, they double my charges, they double my bail. Uh, I had 20 plus charges and they said, maximum 10 sentence on each, go to, go to trial, we'll give you 200. And I saw a guy before me, he refused to sign a plea bargain for 15 and they gave him 200. I couldn't get my head around my plea bargain because it was no less than five, no more than eight. I thought, well, it's not really a plea bargain, is it? Either way, I'm going to do some time here. But then I thought to myself, well, I'm gone. I've been in the county now for like 14 months. Mm. So, And I'm still thinking it's like over there. That if it's under five, yeah. you do half or whatever. So, anyway, I went to court and they gave me seven and a half, called me a menace to society and it was going on and on and on. And I stood up and I said, listen, that's fine. I said, listen, but we've, we've got arrested too. Wild woman. Wild woman. So I said, listen, while she's actually here, I said, 
it's not her fault she's done done anything. I brought her over here and I wouldn't give her a passport, but I said, so whatever time you're going to give her, you might as well give it to me because I'm going to do seven and a half anyway. Mm. I don't think she should do any time. And he said, it's very, I don't know, they used a big word of me, but basically said it doesn't work like that. She's got, a, she had 153 charges herself. What wild woman did? Yeah, yeah. she had the most charges than everyone. Bloody hell. Because she'd actually, she'd pick the phone up and do, do, ah, right, do, yeah. do deals. Okay. And every time anyone called, the, the phones were tapped. So, so she's like linked to Every call all was that. a charge. Yeah. 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 Shit. yeah. No way. So um, tell us about prison life. So you two are separate at this point. You Did you ever come together again whilst you're in, no. inside? No. You never saw each other in, the, in those years? No. We could like communicate a little bit through the British Embassy's legal mail. I would hear that one another's doing. I'd hear that... Oh, how the how would you hear that? Just from all the prisoners coming in. Oh right, okay. Because after the while, great vine, isn't there? Yeah. Mm. I mean, did you make a good network of friends in there, or was that friend? He was running it. They give him, they give him the building to I'd, run. I'd, 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 the whites give me the building to run f- f- for the whites. When you say run, what does that entail? What do you have to do? Well, basically, all the new guys would come in, the young lads and all that. Yeah. You have to sit down, talk to them, tell them what start with trouble, give them the rules. Um, Which are like don't sit on another race's bed. Don't what sit on another race's bed. Yeah. Right. Okay. Don't break bread with another race. Like don't start eating with them or anything like that. Um, don't disrespect another race. Shower often. And just keep yourself to yourself and stay out of trouble. Because what the young lads do, they'd, they'd have a few beers or they'd get on hooch and they'd start. Oh, and a big main one was when you're singing, don't listen to rap. Because you'd have white guys going around there and they'd be singing and they'd be listening to like black hip hop. Mm. And a lot of a lot of them, their own people, say the N word. But you got a white guy singing, and he's saying it, and he's saying the word, and yeah. you're gonna, it's gonna cause a riot yeah. straight away. So that was a no, that was a real not to listen to it. That was yeah, it was a no no. You get smashed on site for listening to it. Right. So you'd give these instructions, rules to people. I give the instructions to real. Yeah. At first, I started off with just having one pod, and there's eight pods in the building, and then after a while, what's a pod? It's just like basically, it's there's a tower there. Right. And there's like sections what go like this. It's like more of a hexagon. Okay. And th- each one's six. And each one of them holds like a hundred prisoners. Like big domes. And um I ended up running all six of them. So I'd have I'd have in each one of them I'd have a white guy and he'd come to me weekly and tell me who's in debt, who's staying out of trouble, who birthdays it is and stuff like that because any of the white guys would sort of birthday we would make like a big feast so did you not deal with the other races am i right in thinking you yeah. just dealt with white people oh yeah no, no i didn't tell the other races what to do right okay but i dealt with just the whites right, okay. every race has those rules uh, right it's so they are, they all have like it's like a hierarchy in each race in yeah each, right, and if, okay if there's problems with other races the head would come and see me directly. right ah uh, yeah okay but we wouldn't We'd never fall out over it. We wouldn't, me and the other heads. It was just take like a personal. structure thing to keep the peace. It was just, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because exactly, yeah. if there's a fight with a white and a black, and then there's a riot, all the prison gets locked down. And there's no drugs coming then in. Then the drugs business stops. The absolute priority of the gangs is to keep the drugs business going. So who's, who's st- are, you, are you still doing that from within? Are you, I'm not, are you no, arranging no. it? I was getting drugs, but I wasn't. I was getting it just from the other prisoners. They were just. As a head, the, 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 I got a percentage. And you got them for me. everybody else, not yourself? No, no, I'll just get them for myself. I for wouldn't yourself. sell it. He kicked down for personal use because he was the head of the building. Yeah. Right, okay. He wasn't dealing. I wasn't right, dealing, okay. so, but they'd give me some for myself. Right. He was running gambling tables and stuff like that. Okay. 
What about you, Sean? What was what what was it like for you? Well, when I first went in, um, I was terrified. Oh, I've seen stuff like Shawshank Redemption. You're so different. Like you are so different, you two. Even though you're like well, they split. They put me in Tower see, Six right away, and they put him and my co-defendants in Tower. What was it in the four? Four. So I go in. No, I've been in the horseshoe for two or three days without any sleep, and then these skinheads come up to me. It's like, hey, we want a word of you, you know, get in this cell over here. Oh, my God. So I go into this cell at the back, they close the door, biggest one gets in my face. He's like, what are your charges? What are your charges? Now, your charges on a little printout that they give you in the horseshoe. It's all legal terminology. I, I was new to this conspiracy, crime syndicate. I, I didn't fully understand what it meant. So I said, I don't know what my charges mean. And that is not, that's not. He, he knocked the guy out who asked him what his charges were. And oh that's how he got that job. So I'm like making a right mess of this now. Now they've got me against the wall about to attack me. What do you mean you don't know what your charges mean? Are you a chomo? Are you a chomo? I don't even know what a chomo is. No, I don't know what the hell Chomo's that. child molester. Yeah. Ooh. So some charges. That's what you thought you were. Some charges are KOS, kill on sight. Right, right away, they will kill a child molest if he gets into that population. And um, Shit. in the end, they made me pull out my charge sheet. They saw I was in for drugs. Thank fuck you had that. I know. Well, they were buzzing off the bail because the bail bond was seven hundred fifty thousand dollars cash only. Right. So they were like, "God damn, what did you do? Who did you kill?" And I was like, "No raves, ecstasy." We, we didn't kill anybody. And one of them was like, well, I shot a guy in the chest at a rave. I was high on GHB. And I'm here for attempted murder. <laughs> and I was like... <laughs> I love the impression. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, fortunately, what happened was, th they were going to check, they were checking me out, right? Yeah. They didn't, they, 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 they didn't trust me. And um, they found out he was in Tower 2. And they found out there was a load of us. And then when we went to the church, we were all on the back row hugging and word just completely spread throughout Towers Jail and no one messed with me once they knew I was with him. Right. Yeah. So what, what kind of, tell us like what you saw in there. Like what was the worst thing that you ever saw like between you both? Or could you not even be able to well, We were housed it? separately, but we could see each other at church. Yeah. So we saw different things at different times. What a place to meet. It's just a place you could all meet because everyone could go there. Oh, could you speak in there? Yeah. You were fine to talk in there. Ask Peter to, to try and whisper. I know, yeah. yeah. I, can't. I can't imagine no, that. I can't. So every, you every, didn't go up in a ball of flames. <laughs> church on the street, past the wall, every 20 minutes is stopping the entire mass yeah. because Peter is on the back row whispering to me. He's like... In the end times, revelations, scoffers and mockers will arise. And they're right now on the back row. The scoffers and mockers on the back row will burn in hell for eternity. <laughs> I just got kicked out of church twice. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the worst thing you saw in the whole of your prison experience? Um, oh, God, I don't even know. I don't even think I want to know now. I'd probably... Uh, I'd have to say it's the black lad hanging. Oh. What was that? What happened in, in that one? He basically hung himself off the bunk bed. Oh. Shit. And that was probably the worst thing to actually wake up and see. And to see it, mm. yeah. yeah. Like in front of you. What about you, Sean? Just people getting, um, looked like they were dead, carried out on stretchers, like not just blood coming out of their head, like yellow fluid coming out of their head, like brain stuff. What? Every day. Oh my God. Every day. In the, in the jail, because it's people coming in and out, all on crystal meth. It's crazy. Heads getting bashed against toilets. Bodies getting thrown around. I saw people's teeth just flying out. I saw a guy with his leg pointing in the wrong direction. I saw a mentally ill old man who wouldn't stop rambling. The gang decided to shut him up. And as I walked past him, blood just squirted right out the back of his head. Shit. So I saw so much stuff, I can't even remember it all. It, it, was, was, like it, was, it was constant. It yeah. was constant in the jail. Just like you become immune to it, it's like you just got. Well, like, like I said, I was crapping it when I went in, and people were coming up to me saying, "You got to get that that look off your face, that nervousness, or else you're going to get smashed." Yeah. Six months in, I've got dead eyes, and even when I got out, I got my driver's license. 
I just look like that, like completely just unemotional. Like, yeah. What's um, talking about like getting out? What's life like now? Like, so how long have you both been out for? I got out in O two. In O two. Yeah. What about you, Sean? So would you have been two thousand? I got. I know. I got released in December of. 2008. All right. Oh, right. You got out in 09, didn't you? Yeah, I got sent down in 02. Yeah. Got out in 09. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I picked him up at the airport in London. Yeah. And he told me just to be there with litres of cider and some fags. And he gets out. What, you're wearing like a white prison thing? Yeah. And uh, a plastic bag? Long hair. Longer, oh, yeah, hair. yeah. I'd be heard that, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't trust the barbers. <laughs> so we we go out. we go outside, and he just gets this like two litre thing of cider, and just drinks like almost the whole thing in a few gulps. <laughs> Why does this not shock me? And he's, yeah, oh, he's, it was lovely as well. He's breezed through the airport, and I breezed through the airport. No one, you know, I thought he would ask me about my what had happened. But then on the radio, some like intercom thing at the airport, they started yelling his name, come to some station or other. All right. So we're like, all right, it's time for us to go. <laughs> so you just got off? We just got yeah, off. Yeah, we just got off, yeah. We just left. So what did you do? Come back up here? Well, yeah. So were you living in London? Did, when did you move to London? No, I was living in Witness for a year at my mum and dad's house. Right. Yeah. So you both moved back up here? I moved in with my dad. Right. And then uh, kicked it for a bit. And then about, I was there for about six months, and then I met my future wife, and then moved in with her, and got married. I was with her for about six months, then got married. We've been together now for, like, I'd say about six years. I don't actually know. It's when you're watching this, sorry. <laughs> 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 so... Is that because, like, so you've, like, reached a point of contentment? Have you stopped? Is it, are you both clean when it comes to what you're doing? Is this, like, so you've come out and you're on the road to being straight and what's happened since? <coughs> <coughs> I drink probably too much and uh, s s I smoke Rocky, smoke a joint now and again. Yeah. But I don't do no speed, don't do no coke, I don't do no weed, don't do anything like that. And is it just a case of... You, you you both going round, aren't you? Doing the chats and the motivationals, but is it mo? Which is, it is motivational speaking, isn't it? You can call it that. Talks to young people and adults yeah. across the country. Yeah. What are you what are you teach? What are you telling kids when you're going into school? I've not watched any of these. I'm I, not. That's the only thing I've not really looked into. So I don't do them, mate. You don't do them. Well, I can't. Can I? Can no. I have the other joint and say, listen, don't do drugs. Uh. True, true. <laughs> so, Sean, what about you? So, you're going into schools. You've got a book. You've no, you've done more than one book. I've got though, thirteen you? books out right now. Thirteen. Yeah, my life story is a trilogy. It's party time. All the naughty stuff we did. Hard time is the jail, and then prison time is sentenced, and then return home. Wow. So I just go in and tell them, "Is my story?" Yeah. I don't go in and say drugs are bad for you. Anything stupid like that. I just show what happened to me and the consequences and emphasise, you know, how dark it was. In, how in, do the kids the react jail. when you're talking about it? Well... Do you think it's beneficial? Obviously, you're going to think it's beneficial because you're carrying on doing it. Speaking of range of schools, from inner city schools, so like Stowe School and Westminster. Yeah. And as soon as getting to the jail conditions, on the edges of the seats, dead rats in the food, the cockroaches crawling all over us at night, the guards murdering Is that why you prisoners. don't eat meat? I don't eat, I'm a veggie because of the dead rats in the jail food, yeah. Oh my God. The Red Death, Mystery Meat Slop, that occasionally had a dead rat in it. One time we gave a rat back to the guards, we complained, they said they'd investigate. Came back later in the day and said jail won't get any trouble, said it was just a potato. Oh my God. With eyes and a tail. <laughs> 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 so all, all this has led, um, you know, to me becoming a speaker. So me and Peter doing all these videos on the YouTube channel. Yeah. Doing talks to adults. And it's massive, isn't it? It is big what you've done, like your, your, your podcast, your YouTube and stuff like that. Yeah, we just got a shout out from Joe Rogan and Eddie Bravo. And, um, Joe Rogan, that's massive. Yeah, yeah, so that was really, really, really helpful from those guys. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Good. 
So go on, you. So you've got your books. I've got all these books in the pipeline. He does too much though. He doesn't. He doesn't. No Just rest. Doesn't start. No, I mean literally. From here now, we've got to go to Cumbria, and he's going to in, in between. He actually does Skype from his phone and does interviews on his phone. While in the car, while driving. I love that, though. That's so good. Just completely just on the ball all the time. I was speaking in Preston in the morning. And so you just do the podcast, don't you? I just do the, pod- the criminal podcast mainly, yeah. Wildman well, yeah. said he's going to start interviewing people on his own soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, Sean. <laughs> Would you like to see that? Put a comment below this video. <laughs> so... We're going to put underneath, actually. Oh, sorry. All the books okay. are available yeah. worldwide on Amazon. Yeah. Audio, ebook, and paperback. Get subscribing as well. Please subscribe to our channel. You've had, you had some great to people Ellen's on. Channel. Yeah, if definitely. you want Wildman's t-shirt, go to everpress.com. What's that? I've got t-shirts out with my face on I it. I need to see it. I definitely <laughs> should have brought one, shouldn't we? I know, I forgot. Slip in. Thanks, I'll pick you one next time we see you one. Definitely yeah. Yeah. do. Right, guys, thank you so, so much for coming. You're welcome. And thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week. Cheers. Bye.